So good morning. Can everybody hear me all right? I have absolutely no indoor voice, so I usually don't need a mic. My name is Tina Williams, and I'm a faculty member here in the Department of Management, and it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeremy Landvater, um, who is one of our MBA alum. He is currently a psychiatrist with the United States Navy and an assistant professor of psychiatry with the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. It is. We like to make it as hard as possible. <laughs> he's got a whole lot of degrees on here. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of say he's got a lot of education. He's one of the smartest people I know, and he gives a great presentation. Um, and I think you guys are going to enjoy it today. And he says it's going to be interactive, so it's going to keep you on your toes. I try to make it interactive. All right. Is it's really it's audience participation. Is there anything important on here you want me to say when I gloss over all your education? Nope. Okay, he's really smart. And he's all yours. Good morning. First of all, I wanted to make sure, can everyone hear me okay? With everything going on, I'm going to do an official mic check. So, uh, so a couple of things as we'll get in, even before I kind of reintroduce myself. Uh, there may be a few mistakes. There may be a few things that don't make sense. Please ask questions because as we'll learn, when you're making decisions or doing things under a time constraint, Sometimes it's not the best, but we still do the best we can. So, title of my presentation, I'm, so I'm Dr. Jeremy Landvader, as, as Tina had said. So, why present on this? So I'm assuming, looks like most of you in here are finishing your bachelor's degree, moving towards MBA, already an MBA. Esteemed faculty members that are still here when I was here. So, who likes making hard decisions under pressure. Very few, I'll say a few people, but not most of us. But as current leaders, future leaders, future executives, we have to get comfortable with it. So that's kind of the intro. I wanted to take a step back uh, for those that were at our keynote speaker this morning. There were a couple things I wanted to build on. First of all, not all psychotherapists discuss your past and where your emotions come from your past. Sorry, that's just a, a side note as a staff psychiatrist. The other part I wanted to say is, you can see on here is, well, you can't really say that. So I was here about 15 years ago. Now, I didn't come. <laughs> so now I, I was already you know, in, in the country and in the state, but Everything that you see me talking about today was because of what East Carolina University did for me. I was down at New River Air Station when I was enlisted in the Marine Corps, applying for a scholarship to try to become a healthcare administrator. And due to this kind of administrative mix up, I needed to get into a school like right away. So I looked at my options. I didn't have a business background. I had some experience working for a bank, but I did not have a business background. My background was in benchtop research and aviation logistics. So on a very desperate phone call one day that was ultimately fielded by Tina, um, that's how I got here. Now that education took me, has taken me from New Mexico to Northern Norway and including on the Atlantic Ocean. The possibilities are endless. It's what you make of it. It's what you get. It's, it's on you. But it's like what our keynote speaker said. It's the, I'm biased because I'm one of these people. It's the hunger and it's the drive that will set you apart. That, and that's, without further ado, that's a little bit of a segue, a little bit not quite related, but it is related. Because all the things that I have accomplished wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for this school and this area was like a parking lot or a field where squirrels used to run off with bagels when I was here. So, oh no. What? It has, uh, it has died. So things don't always go the way we want them to. So who is here by uh, voluntary and who is here by nearly force? Any? 
Volunteer. Who here has had to endure me a previous year? Did you come back willingly? Hey, I'm doing something right. <laughs> Next slide, please. But also, Alrighty, so what I actually really should have started with, I have no disclosures. I have no federal disclosures. I have no state disclosures. I have no, I have no financial disclosures. My opinions are my own. They're not of the United States government or the Navy or the state of North Carolina or anything else. My goal today is just to give a thoughtful and hopefully a little bit entertaining, but more or less useful discussion on topics that or on a topic that maybe we don't get. Now, part of this presentation you get well, I know, because I learned it while I was here. But some of it you don't get, and it's not normally part of business education. Next slide, please. So, decisions, decisions. As many of you are starting now kind of your professional journey, I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. But these are all the things that this University has made it possible for me to do. I, I, I do serve at the air station at Cherry Point. I am an assistant professor. I am on a diplomat of the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology. I am part of the legislative committee uh, within the North Carolina Psychiatric Association. But I'm also still involved in being a healthcare executive, both at more of a, a state and local level, but it's all relative. I, and I say that to you because if you know exactly what you want to do, that's awesome. But one of the values of a business education, in my point, is it's so flexible. You can do so many things with it. Next slide, please. All righty. So for those couple people who said they like making decisions under pressure, what do you like about it? Seriously, that's not a bad, it's not a derogatory question. What do you like about it? Go ahead. OK. Thrill, super understanding. I'm a real like slow, methodical person, so I'm like the opposite. I'm like, ah, no. What else? Or for those who don't like it, why don't you like it? Yes, ma'am. Stressful. Very true. Absolutely. So that call comes in, or you have that briefing, and it kind of ends up being like a news report, or like a, like, I'm sorry, like a police report. You need to know kind of the, okay, what's going on? The how, the what, the when, the where, the why. Like, it's pretty obvious first slide in, in my perspective, it's obvious first slide. But under these high pressure situations where big things might be at stake, and it's like, are we trying to pass a piece of legislation? Are we trying to fund the United States government? Are we trying to, go to war, not go to war, or it's like, or maybe are we just trying to get some, a contract in place so cars can still be made in Detroit. I don't know, like whatever we're trying, this big decision under pressure. But you also, of all of the myriad of things, you need to kind of be more mindful of the timeline, who's it's impacting, uh, and the people who are telling you to do this. Like, is, is it kind of a, a right thing? Is it something you can do? And then one of the thoughts of for those who do and do not like decisions under pressure, because uh, so I, I think about this myself, I was like, why me? Why am I the one who's assigned to this? All right, next slide. So the bomb's lit. So a couple of thoughts, and this is what uh, we actually kind of already mentioned of. So I put a couple kind of conflicting and contrasting. So are you excited? or afraid, maybe both, it can be any of them. Are you ready to start or are you gonna procrastinate? Where it's like, we need to get on this right away because you know, it's a tight deadline. Or it's like, whoa, 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 hold on, let's pump the brakes. We do have a few days or this the good old procrastination of like, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna do that right now. Or confidence versus hesitation. Yes, we can do this. Or it's like, I, I, I don't know. And not because you really don't know. It's kind of like the, the negative hesitation. Like, ah, I don't know. Next slide, please. So if anyone read the little part of the, the description of the presentation, uh, you can't escape this without a morsel of, of neuroscience. So who knows, other than a brain, 
what, what is this? What type of diagram is this? What is it showing? Uh, do we have any science people, medical people, brain people? All right, this brave young lady who raised her hand. Uh, function, yeah, I can't remember if it's functional or, or DTI, diffusion tensor imaging. But what's it showing? What do you think it's showing? Yeah, it's how nerves are running around all over the brain. So in general, the more purple it is, the harder and faster the connections are, the bluer it is or where things aren't quite as fast. So the call comes in, the bomb is lit, we're excited, we're fearful, we're hesitant, uh, we're excited, whatever it is. So this is a incredible generalization. It is much more complex than this. But so we have our, that first, can't really see the pointer that well. So the corpus striatum does many, 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 many things. It also is involved in movement as well, but we're not as concerned about movement for today. We're concerned about cognitive fun functioning. So if you notice, it's like involved in decision-making, rewarding, motivation. Sounds like pretty good things when you're under pressure, right? Like you want that part of your brain involved. But attached with it, and it works in concert, is the amygdala. Also involved in decision making, but brings things like memories and emotional responses in. Could help, could hurt. But if we look kind of here at this front part of the brain, so we have our corpus striatum around here. See lots and lots of activity. This prefrontal cortex, there's lots of thought, because that's where we're thinking and we're analyzing. We're sending it to here to try to put some sort of processing. Uh, our eyes, so occipital lobe, we're doing visual processing and some motor movement up here. But, so even if we're just thinking, this is how active our brains are and we're kind of balancing the decision making, there's the decision making, but there's reward, there's memory, there's emotional processing. And all of that is on fire because your projects do really soon. Makes it harder to think. Next slide, please. So, first things to do, not necessarily pad to paper, unless you're that type of person or notes or however you make it. First stop is to breathe, stand still, whatever you think. Let it soak in of whatever's going on. So like I said, these are not routine decisions. These are high value, impactful, short-term decisions or uh, short fuse decisions. Something perhaps to, to clear your mind, whether it's a mind clearing exercise, meditation, prayer, whatever, or actual like a short jog, something like that, because you're gonna need to prime your brain because it's about to go haywire over the next couple days or hours, depending upon how long you have. While you're doing that, that gives you a chance to process. And I'm not saying this like philosophical processing. Those things that I showed you on the, uh, the connections of the brain finally start to sync up and get on the same page once they kind of start, well, working together better. Now, organize. Now is the time. Put your pad to paper, call your team together, whatever you need to do. All righty, next slide. So, who here can generally define decision science? I know somebody can. I should have brought candy I could throw. So very broadly, it's how we make decisions. Now that is a generally oversimplified answer, but it focuses on many things. But I'm going to, for sake of the presentation, because well, I'm the one who wrote it, going to break it down into kind of two sections. So there's this first one is decision theory. So decision science, and there's kind of these like subtopics. So decision theory. How do we make a decision? But how do we make, and notice the wording of this, how do we make the best choice from a multimodal and rational approach? So take home words in here are best, multimodal, and rational. Now, what's multimodal? Well, that could be interviewing people, that could be sitting down and looking at balance sheets, financial documents, firing up your favorite analytical software. If, is SAS still a thing, Dr. Byerline? Is that what we still use? SAS, the stats pro? 
I don't, okay. Other people do that now, I, I don't. Or <laughs> whatever, how you're gonna try to collect and analyze and process this data, you know, maybe it's contacting human resources to say like, hey, is this something, do we have public affairs? Well, who do we gotta get involved? Stuff like that. That's when you are getting all of the pieces moving. That's, the, that's multimodal. And now, rational. How do we define rational? The absence of irrationality? Trick question, it's hard to define. It's this kind of, it's like, that seems about right. That's kind of how we end up usually defining rationality. So, and this is the part everyone's learning now, or has learned, or is in the process of perfecting, because it's never really learned. It constantly changes. This is what you come to business school for. That's why I came to business school, and I still use this all the time. So I'm not focusing just on this part, because I'm assuming this is what you spent the last four, two, six, whatever years of your life trying to get a better understanding of. That's why you have your accounting classes, your finance classes, your stats classes, everyone else that I have you know, not mentioned. But in the end, you should have what's my desired outcomes. Now, outcome or outcomes. Now, maybe your boss or whoever this thing went off is like kind of already said what your desired outcome is. And it's like, well, what's the probability this can actually happen? Oh, is this pretty, you know, pretty easy? Sure thing, it's gonna happen. Uh, is it feasible? It's like, well, this has a high probability if we can make it work. But we may not be able to make it work. It, there may be other issues, constraints that's just gonna prevent it. One of my favorite topics because I used to manage some of this, data quality and data integrity. What's the difference between the two? Somebody in this room has to know it other than these two ladies. No one? No, oh, 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 I see somebody being volunteered. Okay. <laughs> Do you wish to respond or I can, con I can continue? Your choice. Exactly. So what is so the quality is like is that so is this good information? Is this relatively bad information? Is it helpful information? Is it not helpful information? And then the integrity. Is this from a source I can trust? So is this good information from someone that I can trust? Or is this like best info I have in the short amount of time is here, say, from Reddit? I you know and sometimes we don't really get good information, but we kind of have to, as leaders, as people who analyze stuff, have to then make that judgment. Can I believe my data? Is it good data? And although I put it last, it's really throughout this whole process is, and the relativity of time. Do you really have a time to do any of that analyst or the analyzing? Do you have time to call the team? Did did the actual bomb just go off outside the building and we're trying to figure out how we're going to get people out where there's no, it's just a reaction, there's no time to think about it. So time is relevant through all of this because it's like, in general, you know, the answer is like, well, spend more time, get a consensus, but sometimes you don't have that luxury. So you do the best you can with the time that you have and people generally will understand that. All right, next slide, please. All right. So, the other part, for the sake of my presentation, there's many parts. The other part of decision science is decision making. So we have the kind of more black and white, this is what we need to do, the analytical side. So now, how do we make the decision? Ways to make a choice. Now notice, it does not say good choice. Ways to make a choice considering multiple factors which may be rational or irrational. So during any time when we are making decisions as human beings, and for a lot of part also in animals, 
we're doing this decision making and decision theory at the same time. But it's important to know, and maybe you never knew this before today, your brain's balancing this at the same time. And the more stressed you are, the more anxious you are, the more deadlines happen and right now, the harder this stuff is going to be. So this has an infinite amount of topics, but I'll put on, I just put up a couple that I thought might be relevant in time situations. So when you're trying to make your decision, you got all your data trying to make your decision, so there's a normative response. Anybody want to take a guess what that is? It defines itself. Is that a volunteer? Oh, yes. Yeah, kind of the common response, the expected response, which actually may be the best response there is. But it also might be a bad response. You, you don't know. Cognitive function. Anybody want to take a guess at that? So kind of multidimensional. Part of that is things called executive function, like how can you, in your brain, plan things? What's your kind of spatial orientation? How do you allocate time? How does your brain work to make decisions? Things that also factor into cognitive function. Sleep, like are you really tired and your brain's not working correctly? Are you drunk? Should you not be doing this because you're under the effects of drugs or alcohol? Uh, probably not asked to make this decision, but like, are you comatose? Well, your cognitive function is going to be so substantially impaired that you can't make a decision. The next two, who's familiar, if anyone, with logical fallacies and cognitive distortions? Show of hands, logical fallacies. Ready? Cognitive distortions. We have one, two, oh, two, we have a couple, three. So logical fallacies, we learned that more of here. I'll go into a little bit more detail. Cognitive distortion, so I, I threw this in. This is also on the psychological side. So logical fallacies, as, they, as it, it identifies itself, are kind of problems of our thinking towards a situation. We're making some, maybe some assumptions or some techniques we shouldn't use. Cognitive distortions are errors in our thinking. And so this is used particularly in, in psychotherapy. For people who are otherwise you know, rational not, and not drunk, not comatose, not things like that, there may not be an error in your logic, but kind of how you're thinking and got there, there could be some problems. More likely to be exacerbated in a time crunch. And the last one that we all need to be aware of is bias. And that's perhaps this not a racial bias or a gender bias. That's like, is it a location bias? It's like, I don't want to make this decision. This is going on in Raleigh, and I don't really care about something in Raleigh, or whatever, whatever have you. You have to real, even in this panic, uh, this time-fused situation, it's like, maybe my bias is impacting my decision. Doesn't necessarily mean you need to excuse yourself from it, but maybe it does. But at the same time, you might have to ask someone else, like, hey, does this, am I thinking this through right? Am I missing something? All right, next slide. So I'm going to apologize that this is kind of small. Actually, it's really small. And I'm not going to go over each one of these. These are just some of the common logical fallacies. And I know it's hard to see, but it shows some errors in our logic. So I'll just point up a few. So slippery slope. Most of us are kind of familiar with something like that, where it's like, oh, I can answer this question, but that's going to make me kind of uncomfortable. Put this in another compromising situation. Uh, black or white thinking. There's no room in between, you know, my way or the highway, good or bad. Uh, some that we are, you know, appeal to authority. Well, we also like, need to respect authority, but sometimes it's easier to appeal to them. Appeal to nature, anecdotal. That's where sometimes you can have the most power by giving this anecdotal story, but it doesn't really match with what the data has. So it might be a fallacy, but it might be a tool um, and there's, there's several others. And Ms. Williams, if you go to the next slide. So cognitive distortions, although the names are different, you'll notice that many of these are the same. 
or similar-ish. So we have black and white thinking, uh, overgeneralization, which may be something like a bias, uh, catas catastrophizing, or catastrophizing, sorry, uh, catastrophic thought patterns. All of this, so and I put all this to one, to make you aware, but if we are, don't have our thoughts, if our thoughts are distorted and our logic has fallacies, and it's gonna happen more quickly because now we're under a time crunch, our decisions are going, to, are going to be more flawed. Next slide. Alrighty, well, our, our time is, is going, the fuse is burning, and now detonation is about to happen. Okay, who knows the difference between a point target and an area target? Yep. Correct, correct. So anyone who didn't hear, as it says, point target, that's exactly what you're trying to hit. Area target's kind of the general area. Most of our decisions, although we want it to be pointed, are, they're gonna have some broader impact. This is not gonna be like one person or one street or one industry. There's gonna be some sort of a ripple effect. So we've come to our, we, we did our analysis, we tried to factor in fallacies, tried to scrub it as clean as we could, so we have our decision. Going back to now, so now we need to examine the decision. Is it reasonable? So when I talked about like reason, uh, being reasonable, is it feasible? So also notice reasonable doesn't always mean rational and unreasonable doesn't always mean irrational. There's an interplay in there. Can the decision be implemented? It's like, hey, we have a good decision. Uh, it's actually kind of feasible. We think it could work, but oh, we need someone else's support to do this and there's no way he or she's gonna say yes. Or maybe they'll definitely say yes. What are the long and short term implications of the decision? Very few big ticket decisions we make under duress are gonna, or they're gonna have short and long-term implications. You know, do we make this decision so we live to see next week? Or do we kind of tailor our response now so we can see next year? Oftentimes that decision isn't overly clear. And you have to try to balance the two. In whichever decision you make, be prepared for the consequences. Because something is, so either one, people are not gonna like it, or you're gonna have unintended consequences. It's like, well, I was really trying to uh, you know, do this thing. I didn't realize it was going to take out the whole road. Next slide. Okay, so now we even thought through our decision. Getting closer, getting closer. Now here comes the desperation stage. Where it's like, oh my goodness, is this gonna work? Did I do something wrong? So a couple questions. I know I ask myself, but a couple of these I wanna go through, and as I go through them, I'm really curious if any of you have ever heard of or thought of this before, just because I'm an inquisitive person, which is why I can't seem to get myself out of school and giving presentations. Is this tasking of this hard situation, like, I said appropriate, but what I meant is like, is it legal, is it lawful? Like the person who told me to do this, so if Dr. Byerline comes and tells me to do something like, hey, I want you to speed real fast going all the way home. Well, she can tell me that, but she doesn't have the authority to say that. In the haste of making the decision, did somebody task you with something they actually can't do or shouldn't do, or maybe it's kind of questionable? Can the decision actually be delegated elsewhere? Do I have people for this? And I shouldn't have been, I should be supervising them. No, I mean, as a leader, you want to take ownership for it, but it doesn't necessarily mean every single play on the football field isn't a QB sneak. There's other things you know, going on there. It doesn't mean you're not part of it, but it may not just be you. And in your desperation to get an answer, you may have missed it. This is one I like to stop and pause on. Does a decision actually have to be made? It's implied, but does it? 
as anyone ever thought about in these times where like, maybe you don't have to make a decision. Because as relatively, you know, junior starting a career, it's, you know, it's doing the analysis, it's, you know, kind of pleasing the team, pleasing the boss. But as you grow and become more senior, realize maybe, maybe it's best, this is not going to blow over, it's a big deal, but maybe it's best not to just make the decision. If it doesn't mean catastrophic failure or some terrible, terrible outcome, it's like, you know what? We're just gonna watch this real closely. We're gonna, we're gonna prepare for blowback or secondary consequences, but maybe we're just not gonna take action. The next part is, so if you have to make a decision, do you have to make a good decision? Is it just one where you have to do something? Is this kind of like a public affairs thing where it's like, it doesn't matter what you do, you just gotta do something. You have to stand up there and it's like, oh my goodness, something terrible happened. Uh, we're working on it. You know, maybe that's the decision of the day. And then, well, what's a good decision? Well, not a bad decision. Well, okay, but still, is, is it something, is it pleasing to the public? Is it pleasing to the shareholders? Is it pleasing to your boss? Is it pleasing to the people that work for you? The answer is probably not yes to all of those questions. Is it good enough? Is it a satisficing answer? The short fuse decision, it's not going to be perfect. Is a bad decision good enough? Sometimes it is. I mean, as long as it's not like catastrophically horrible, it's just like, ah, uh, yeah, we're just gonna do this for right now because we gotta do something. A, a bad decision may be a good enough decision. And then to swing back through, what are the consequences of not making a decision? Is it something like work stops, our nurses walk out of the hospital and they're not gonna work anymore and it's gonna, the hospital's gonna be, come to a screeching, or a screeching halt or is this going to be like an inconvenience? Well, we should maybe make a decision, but if we don't make one right now, because it's, it's just not a good time, we're missing really crucial parts of the data, maybe we just have to say, like, guys, we don't know. We can't make a decision right now. Possible. Before, because like I said, I'm curious, has anyone ever thought about the cost of not making a decision or not making a good decision? Because in kind of the when time is of the luxury, we don't worry about that as much, or we ask for more time. But sometimes in the heat of the moment, we just have to say, uh, no, we, we just can't do it right now. And, and here's why, give some reason. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so we made our, we made our decision, it went good enough, or bad not, or absence of bad, I've said many times, so not everyone is going to be happy with your answer. Someone is going to generally not like you or like it, or there's going to be some consequences, but you either had to make a decision or you had to intentionally, your decision was to not make a decision. It happens. But in these situations, so that's why I led off with like, who likes to make high pressure situations? A couple of these gentlemen said they do. There's nothing wrong with that, as I, I was hoping there would be some. Uh, but before any of this happens, as young leaders and getting into positions of leadership, part of this is knowing yourself, knowing your team, and knowing your organization. It's, but it's also three and of the same. But am I someone who likes making high visibility, high pressure situation, or uh, determinations, thoughts, and if that answer is no, two parts. You know, reasonably, maybe try to find yourself in a position where like, you don't have to frequently do this. And maybe you don't want to be the press secretary fielding all these high you know, questions that are not just ever going to be satisfactorily answered and are going to come all the time. Maybe your, best, your talents are best served doing something else for yourself, for your team, or your organization. Re-ask those same questions to your team. It's like. We're the crisis response team. Oh, I guess I'm always gonna be making these high pressure short term decisions. Maybe this isn't the place for me. Or maybe you're, to go on, maybe you're working for FEMA. It's like, well, sheesh, we only come on board when things have to be done quickly and things are bad. You know, maybe once I get some time in and get things established, maybe I need to start you know, looking to transfer somewhere else. Or 
You're the person that's like, I thrive on this. I get so bored with mundane tasking. I need, I need the thrill of the chase. I need to ride shotgun with the police. I, I don't know, something, something like that. So in the, when things aren't, so the off season, to continue a previous football metaphor, when things are not on fire, is reviewing. Hey, how'd we do? How'd I do? How'd the organization do? How would we try to do this better next time? If there is room for improvement, because sometimes there's not. Things come out of left field, they're due tomorrow. It's like, ah, oh, here you go. That's all I could do. But also using that analysis, that after action report, stuff like that. So, well, maybe there can be something learned to improve things for next time. Or if anything, just monitoring your situation. Hey, we, things are unpredictable, but we can get a general sense of where things may be coming from so we know how to respond next time, or at least be a little bit more better equipped. And then last but not least, the situation's generally resolved, maybe hopefully happily ever after, maybe not, but it's done, so then it's time to celebrate however you like to celebrate. And on that note with celebration, next slide please. That is the end of my presentation. So on here, uh, it was just I was inspired by kind of everything that happened on Friday when uh, I was so thankful uh, that I had the opportunity to come back. And Tina says like, hey, you can do one of your other presentations. Like, no, 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 I like doing something, something new. So I'll do this time constraint thing. It was humorous enough because earlier in the week I was in Washington, DC. I just happened to be there on Tuesday by happenstance when they're trying to elect a new speaker of the house. But we were discussing through uh, kind of this uh, advocacy group that I'm part of with the American Psychiatric Association is trying to demonstrate the time sensitivity of, of bills in the House and the Senate and things like that. And so all the things that I was just talking about were like actively using on that day. So it was inspired. Um, so on that note, if there is still time, because I think I ran a little over and got started late. I think you probably have a few minutes for questions, but I want to make sure y'all all know about the QR codes. You should be familiar with them from other sessions by now. Make sure to take a snap and give your feedback on Jeremy's presentation, and you can see if there's any questions. That we didn't make sure to and before, in case uh, we all have to storm out of here quickly, um, I will be outside. I'll be at the networking lunch and or reception, whatever we're calling it. And any, if you want to email me, that's my email address is really easy. It's jeremy.landvader at gmail.com. And then you can also, I have the app that I'm quickly trying to get used to, so you can also send me a message on there. But now, questions? Yes, sir. What's the best response when you aren't So I'm going to somewhat deflect your question. It's hard to say what the best response is because it would be trying to realize why aren't they satisfied. And if that's something you can address, if it's something like, well, they don't like my response because I was the one who signed the petition and their house just got bulldozed down. That's going to be a hard answer because like, yeah, I totally get why you're not happy with me. Or is it something it's like, hey, um, why didn't you do this thing that was completely unrelated? It's like, I, it's like, then at that point, it's kind of like, I don't understand why you're upset with me because this wasn't related. So I'm not answering your question quite directly, but it's trying to understand why the person's unsatisfied. And can you reasonably do something ab about it? Um, because not to dismiss anyone, but sometimes there's something that's clearly you cannot really do anything about. It. You can always hear them out, but sometimes it's kind of like, I'm really sorry, sir, ma'am. This is not anything I have control over. Uh, have a nice day, but you know, please go that way. <laughs> that somewhat answer your question? Were you the same person that posted something like that and the, your face looks familiar? Okay, never mind. It was a similar question that came up on the, uh, the, the app, so this I was going to ask. Anyone else? All right. On that note, I'll stay kind of in this general area, and then the, the day is yours. I don't know if there's anybody here to act like or not. Of course. Thank you.